Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truths. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and pleased to tell you that the CODIS is back out in print, second edition, all the corrections, and got the rights back through a big fight that you all know about. It was a public uh, issue, but now we've got the rights back, and you can go to Amazon and get it both in Kindle and in paperback. Don't miss out on this diabolical plot by Satan through the testing of DNA, weaponizing DNA, and trying to wipe out the lineage of the Jews that will bring Jesus back. It's a plot that's biblically sounded, but will excite you like none other. Also, go to ignitingnation.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and take a look at my brand new book called the Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. God uses the things of the natural to reveal supernatural truth. And so this is a book that takes you on a Bible study from the dirt all the way out to the fruit of the tree, showing you seven supernatural truths in seven different parts of the Tree of Life. Today I'm very honored to have uh, the opportunity to talk with Rusty George who uh, has written a new book called Better Together, Discover the Power of Community. Rusty is the lead pastor of Real Life Church in Valencia, California. Through his 11 years at RLC, the church has grown to over 6,000 people and three campuses. He speaks regularly at conferences across the country, he lives with his wife and two daughters in Santa Clarita, California. Rusty George, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So was uh, Little Rusty a church kid? Was Little Rusty, uh -huh. Little Rusty, uh, was he the uh, uh, button collared and, and going to church every, every Sunday and heard all about the Lord all his life? Absolutely. My parents are first generation Christians. And when they got married and discovered they were pregnant, they thought, we don't know what we're doing, so let's go to church. So they started going to church, and we all kind of grew up in the faith together, uh, which meant they did whatever their church told them, which was you be in church every time the doors are open. So we were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, occasional events on other days of the week. And yes, I had a white suit, a tie, and white shoes that went along with it. So I was there all the time. Well. What did that do for you mm. from a standpoint of you are a self-described as I am, which is shocking to people when people like you and I who are, I mean, I do four hours a day of live TV uh, and I tell people I'm an introvert mm -hmm. and they go, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. Right. Now, even on the testing, I come out as an extrovert because of what I do, I identify myself with what I do, but my comfort area is I'm perfectly happy with my little 12-pound terrier sitting on my lap while I'm either watching uh, a bunch of spy shows or re researching a book or uh, just kind of being in the zone of, of my space. And you identify with that. Uh, I do. And I often tell people that the, the thought is because you and I stand up on a stage and speak or we do television or whatever, that we're extroverts. But I remind them that this is easy for me to do because they're not talking back. Right. So <laughs> I can speak and walk away. And that's an introvert's dream. So I am an introvert, and I always have been, but I don't think I knew I was an introvert. I didn't even know those terms until I got into college. Uh, so I always had this, this kind of internal wrestling with, I really should be more like some of my friends. I really should be more like my dad, who's really outgoing and meets friends easily and has a line for everything. Uh, so you know, you grow up in that social setting and go into church uh, I was around a lot of people like that, but I also did feel this kind of strange, um, I'm glad I'm here, but it's uncomfortable because I'm in a crowd. So there were some odd moments, but I think I learned how to persevere through it because I could go home and be alone for a while in my bedroom and just kind of decompress. 
You know, one of the struggles that people don't really understand for people like you and I is that there is an actual person behind the pastor. There's Correct. actually a person behind the rabbi. There's a person. And we have personal feelings. I, I know that uh, there's events that sometimes the moment I walk into the event, and yes, I'm, I'm doing this on international television in front of millions of people, uh, that the moment I get there, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to right. leave. Okay? Uh, I figure out how to work the room. All right? Right. I make sure that I've met and I greet every person I possibly can, uh, shake a hand, ask about the child, and then uh, almost in, have a mental calculation as to watching the cup fill up to the point to say, okay, this is a good time for me to kind of let, and let them, let the extroverts do what the extroverts do. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I heard a story one time about Soren Kierkegaard who would spend all of his time writing, but he knew he had to be social, so he'd just find whatever the biggest party was, walk through the room, say hi, and leave. So he could at least be said that he was there. Uh, I resonate with that. And I think on a typical Sunday, it's easier for, easier for me to manage because I can do the, the fast walk, you know? Mm -hmm. you walk by, shake hands, how you doing, keep going. Uh, the more difficult settings are in a person's home, yeah. uh, at a party that you've been invited to, and I'm not in charge, I don't have an agenda, they know I have nowhere else to be, and I have to just sit there and endure it. Uh, and there is that moment where you realize it is time to go. <laughs> and it's not that we don't love people. We love, no, not we, at all. We, we love people. It's, right. it's just that if you look at our calendars and our schedules and the things we have to do, uh, and, and yet, I will say that God is the God of redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do 15 hours of sitting in this chair behind the camera. And I do speak almost every night. And I do speak almost every weekend. Or I do speak every weekend. Uh, but I have more free time mm -hmm. than you would normally have with a schedule that busy. And God honors who we are. I think Jesus... God in the flesh mm. said, I've got to have my moments where I've got to just get away right. from you people. Right, right. Yeah, you see that a lot in the Gospels where he withdraws to a solitary place. He does that. I'm fascinated by the story we read about in Mark where he's been up late healing people. And then he gets up while it's still dark so he can go and be alone. And there's that classic line where the disciples come to him and say, hey, everybody's looking for you. And he says, good, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, when we bring it out into the open and we take it, and, and it's not something that's dark in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I come out on the test as an ENTP uh, okay. because I answer the questions based on what I do not how I feel. Okay. I would prefer this, but I, this is what I do. So I, it, it's a it's a description of who who I who I what I perform as. Now, does that mean right. does that mean we're phony? Does that mean we're wearing a mask? Does that mean we're not authentic? And the answer to that question is no. We are absolutely not phony. We're not frauds. We're not fake. But we do like our alone time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's the uh, people don't necessarily energize us. We love them. We'll care for them. We'll take care of them in some way, but they don't energize us. Um, for an extrovert, they're energized by people. They love those social settings. Uh, they process out loud. Uh, it, is a, it is a great moment for them. For you and I and other introverts, we process internally. We need that downtime. Uh, we do our best thinking in the shower because we're completely left alone. Uh, we need to sit on the couch and stare at the TV or stare at the walls, uh, whatever it takes, just to replenish a little bit. And, and if people were really think about it, they would appreciate the fact that uh, God set aside eight hours mm. called sleep. Mm -hmm. That is an introvert's greatest location because... 
it clears everything out and it's a clear path for God to pour into you. He poured mm -hmm. into Joseph, he poured into Daniel, he poured into Jacob, he poured into a lot of people in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He poured into John at Patmos through this, this conscious, semi-conscious, unconscious, I'm not in control of myself, I'm in this complete surrender and I dedicate my night, my sleep time, and I wake mm. up in the morning with ideas I've never had before. I, mm -hmm. I awake in the morning uh, with skills mm. I have never been trained to have, but mm. God has prepared me because all of a sudden I find myself during, during the day. And, and listen, I'm, I'm Jewish. I hire people to do work for me. I don't do my own repairs on my car. I've never been under the hood of a car. I wouldn't know what to do under the hood of a car. But yesterday, my favorite belt broke. And it, I saw it had little screws. And all of a sudden, I'm there with the toolkit, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I put it together, and I, I fixed the broken belt. And I'm thinking to myself, where did that come from? Uh -huh. I, 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 might right. have had a, I might have had a screwdriver in my hand eight times in my life. Where right. did it come from that I could deal with these tiny little screws on a manufactured belt from some country where they don't speak any of my language? But mm -hmm. that's what God does when we get into this. I, 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 I guess it, it's kind of like the living, breathing example of dying to self because we're not self-absorbed. We're... Uh, I, I guess I can do it better for you in Hebrew. The word hallowed that we use in the English mm -hmm. language in Hebrew translates to set apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the introvert part of us is set apart, mm -hmm. which is interesting because you've written a book <laughs> saying we're better together. And here mm -hmm. you and I are talking about how we like the alone time. But, mm -hmm. but we don't do it to the exclusion. We're not, the, we're not the hermits. We're not the, uh, my desire is not to go out and live in Montana, uh, you know, where my closest neighbor is 150 miles away from me. That's, right. like, that's not my desire. Uh, there are those people who are like that, but that's not who you and I are just trying to describe because we, right. we are better together. And contact uh, is a natural human condition. It's a human need for us to connect. It, it's, it's important for you and I to spend the first 15 minutes of this interview just mm -hmm. you and I connecting. Correct. That's right. You know, that's right. Yeah, there is there is this relational component that does bring stuff out of us that we could never do on our own. Um, there's a discovery of spiritual gifts, and more importantly, not just a discovery of ourself, there's a place for us to exercise our spiritual gifts. It's hard to be a servant of other people if you're never around other people. And for us to model the way that Jesus told us to live, it's not just to be so self-consumed, we only do what feels good to us, which is not just an addiction or pleasure seeking, but for us, it could be alone time, but it's also finding ways to serve other people, which requires other people to be present. You bring up one of the single most important components, in my opinion, to finding joy in your community, whether it's a church or it's an organization, and that's if, if you know what your spiritual gifting is, mm -hmm. don't allow yourself to be assigned to something that is contrary to your spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. So if your gift is hospitality, don't work in the back office helping them count the offering. That's right. not your gift. You're going to wind up not being happy with that church. You're going to find something you don't like about the teaching. You don't like about the preaching. You don't, and you don't know why you're dissatisfied. It's because you're not doing what God has gifted you to do. And mm -hmm. as believers, we tend to not take responsibility for our own condition. We go into church with this cross our arms. All right, pastor, bless me if you can. Right. Exactly. And I, I, I've seen the same thing. And I, 
I write about that in the book. I tell this story about my daughter and I going out for a, a daddy daughter date one morning and, and we're trying to figure out where we're going to go. And, and so we have a checklist. Uh, she wants ice cream. Uh, she wants a place with a playground and all I care about is diet Coke. So with that in mind, we end up at McDonald's. <clears throat> we go in there. Uh, she gets her ice cream. I get my diet Coke. We're headed to the playground and she sees a friend from school. And so they start talking and I, I talk to this, uh, this friend's mother. And so we're talking briefly and she said, oh, I've been to your church. And I said, oh, okay, well, great. Nice to meet you. And she said, yeah, we're still, we're still looking for the perfect church. And I thought, wow, I'm not sure if you realize that was offensive, but thank you. <laughs> right. uh, and, and she didn't. But as I, as I left there, I thought she's doing what, what we did to find the perfect place to spend the morning. We had a checklist of what we wanted. And she has a checklist of what she wants. And good luck finding a perfect place because no place is perfect. That's what makes it available for the rest of us, right? And unfortunately, the big breakdown of community people are dealing with right now is they just keep church shopping. And they try to find a place that meets their needs. And once they figure out my needs are being met and I'm happy here, then something goes wrong. Uh, where the opposite is what really works plug into a church, overlook, overlook the fact that they're just humans trying to follow Jesus and serve as exactly what you said. Find your gifting and serve it out well. We have a saying in our church, and that is, if somebody stops serving, start the clock because they'll be leaving before long. And they do, because once you stop serving, then you do cross your arms. Then you do just attend for an hour on the weekend and you think it's all about you and there's going to be weekends, it's not your perfect worship service. It's not a message you haven't heard before. It's going to be something you think, that wasn't for me, and then you leave. And that's when the selfishness really begins to ruin the church. You know, if you just described what, what uh, I, I kind of translate a similar story in the way that, uh, describe to me your, the best meal you've ever had, okay? What was your condition when you had that best meal? Well, I was hungry. Huh. Oh, That's good. I was hungry and I had my best meal. Now, if I served you that same meal and you weren't hungry, what would your rating of that meal be? Mm. Well, that meal wouldn't have been very satisfying. Well, why is it today it was the best meal you ever had and Two weeks ago, it was the worst meal you ever had. Well, because I came hungry. This is the message we need to come to church. I need to come hungry. Mm. Now, I come hungry. Beanie Weenies is gourmet. <laughs> it's got umami. It's got the blend of flavors. It's got everything. It's a Bobby Flay creation. Oh. Right? It's a can of Beanie Weenies because right. I'm so hungry that anything on my palate tastes good. This is the way we're supposed to come Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday, whatever day, Friday night, whatever it is, you're supposed to come hungry mm. because even if, you heard, even if you preach the same message 52 weeks in a row, mm. if I'm hungry, I'll get something out of that same message that I've heard 52 weeks in a row. I might, Absolutely. I might learn the line. You, you sing the songs. You learn the lines to the song. Why do you, why do you like that song? Why do you play that song over and over again? Mm -hmm. right. That's right. You're not critical of the of 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 the of the artist by saying those are the same lyrics I heard when I played that song yesterday. Right. All right. right. It does have so much to do with the condition in which you show up. And if you're, if you're there thinking, what's in it for me, uh, odds are it's not going to be enough. But like you said, if you come hungry, if you're interested in just being there to serve, if you come into your, let's say, your row in which you sit every single Sunday, and you're not there just to receive, but you're looking for people that are new, you're greeting people, you're welcoming people, um, you're, you're thinking about the lines of the song that maybe you've sung before, but you've never sung it in this setting as far as where you are right now in your life. If you're listening to the message. If you brought a friend with you, you listen through their ears, not just your own. Uh, it has an entirely different experience than when you just show up for yourself. 
Imagine a 44-year-old Jewish guy coming to hear the gospel for the first time. <laughs> wow. That was me. Mm -hmm. I saw the billboards that said Jesus saves. I was unimpressed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Jews invest. We don't save. Right. <laughs> so I'd be looking for a sign that says Jesus invests, <laughs> all right, not Jesus saves. So, you know, you got to think of the vernacular and, and the audience and who you're talking to. Right. There are billboards all over the world, and every Jewish person's looking at, you know, what's the big deal? This place is paying like 0.002%. He saves, all right? <laughs> That's good, right. Good money management, I'm fine with that, but he invests well. I want to get to know the guys. He got some tips. Does he got some? You know. All right. Now, if you're right. making the billboards because you're you're that good, that you invest. All right. Right. And they're advertising that. That's who I want as my broker. Well, right. that's a great great point. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the eyes in which we look, and if we don't take that position uh, of what you and I do in the pulpit and and teaching and preaching and and writing. You didn't write this book to you. This mm -hmm. book has you in it. You wrote mm -hmm. it for the reader. Right, right. I did, and I, I wrote it from, a, I kind of came at it from two angles. The first one was, I'm friends with a lot of pastors, and we always email each other, uh, like, do you have a message on this? Have you ever taught on this? And the common email I get is, do you have any messages on teaching people how to get into community? And we don't have many out there. So I started writing some on that. And then I thought, you know, this is my own personal journey as well, because I am an introvert and I naturally run from, hey, let's all get together or let's get into a small group or let's have, you know, what, what used to be a Sunday school class. Um, those are difficult experiences. So I typically ran from them and I began to see a correlation between any dark moment in my life any kind of self-loathing I would go through, any kind of walking through depression or anxiety or anything like that, I was usually doing so while I was alone. But there was something healing about community. So I wanted to write not just about the power of community, but also how to do community. Because I think all of us believe that people are necessary to our lives. It's just we don't do it very well because so much of our society teaches us how to be alone how to work out alone, how to stay home all the time, how to work from home, how to shop alone. I mean, think about even our daily devotions. It's just focused on ourselves and what we can get out of it. So what is it we could possibly learn from being together when Jesus said it's so valuable for us to do that? So that's where the book came from. You know, it's so interesting. You, you've got a church of 6,000, three campuses, uh, and the model that begins to take shape today is more the multi-campus uh, mm -hmm. uh, not a pastor a preacher kind of uh, they bring the message but they don't perform right. they, they're more in, in 6,000 people you're in a 10 to 15 million dollar maybe 20 million close to 20 million dollar budget uh, mm. You're running a small corporation. You have employees. You have management issues. You have uh, mm. co-pastors and sub-pastors and under-shepherds. And it's, it becomes an, or, an organizational chart. Imagine like uh, um, uh, we have here with Church of the Highlands, uh, mm -hmm. with Chris Hodges, you know, 22 campuses, you know, 70,000 people, uh, 125 under-shepherds. It's, it's a large management it's different than what we look at in the Bible as what first century Judaism was like, what the early church was like. But yet, uh, we have this one thing in common that's supposed to bind us together, and that is our belief that Jesus died for our sins. And this is what makes us have something. That is the thread and, mm. and the needle which sews us together. But we as a people group as a body are fractured mm -hmm. were 38,000 denominations 38,000 different ways to do Christianity mm -hmm. 
38,000 different ways of quote unquote right and wrong. Mm. How is that fellowship? Um, mm. God says in his word, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Mm. Community is a conjunction, or a, yeah, a conjunction, common unity. Mm. That's what community is, the common unity of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but never forgetting that it's God's plan of salvation. It's not all about Jesus. It's all about God and his plan of salvation and the model given to us in Messiah for what's below the cross mm. in the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. if, if the fourth commandment was the cross piece, the horizontal mm. piece, honor mm -hmm. the Sabbath and keep it holy, and right. one, two, three, and half of four are about our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. and half of four and all the rest were about our relationship with mankind. Right. We'd have to ask ourselves the question, well, if salvation is not the end point, it's the starting point. Now I've secured my relationship with God. What am I supposed to do with the rest of my life? I'm supposed to live not vertically. I'm supposed to live horizontally. Right. I'm called into this ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I'm an ambassador. Ambassadors have to do what you and I have to do. We have to go out and meet and greet people. They mm -hmm. have to go out and be the voice of God. So how do we form community? How do we become everybody's model, quote unquote, the Acts chapter two church? Hmm. The Acts chapter 2 church, there was no steeple on the upper room. They went out mm -hmm. and made disciples and preached the gospel, but as a unit. And it was interesting that it was 12, down to 11, then back up again. Uh, but that seemed to be a kind of a good working number. Mm -hmm. um, your inner circle. Your, hmm. your board, your elders and deacons. and It's, it's a workable number of people. Bigger, mm -hmm. bigger than that, you've got to start dividing. You're going to have to have divisions. Smaller than that, it's kind of my four and no more. <laughs> so right. where do you find the balance and how do you discover, first of all, how to live in community mm -hmm. and then in your book, how do you grab a hold of the power, uh, the, the dunamis, the, 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 the sheer power of community, which the result of it, the product of the power of community is transformation, mm. a transformation of a church, mm. of a neighborhood, of a city, of a county, of a state, of a country of a nation, of the world. Mm -hmm. That's the power given to us in the Bible. That's what it right. says we're supposed to do. Right. So I, walk, walk me through a little bit of your model because I, 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 I do get confused about small group, mm -hmm. right? If small group doesn't have uh, a study component to it or doesn't have a biblical connection to it, then my small group goes out and plays golf once a week. That's my small group. I sign up mm -hmm. for that. That's, that's really not the intention of building community. That's, that's playing golf. Okay. I sh I, <laughs> well, I think that, I, I think that that's accomplishing community. I think what you choose to add to it is on, you know, is up to you. You've chosen to add golf to your group of four. Um, you can choose to add scripture, you can choose to add prayer, but community still exists. I, I think what, what I keep coming back to is what Jesus talks about in John 17, when he's praying and we have this lengthy prayer of what he says to his father, and he says, here's what eternal life is, that they believe in me and that you sent me, 
And here's how they do that. That everyone would be one, just as you and I are one, and that they would be within us. And this is just such a beautiful picture of the Trinity and how Jesus himself exists in community, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he invites us not to be bystanders to that, not to be spectators to that, but to be within that. That it's almost as if the church, the community, the ecclesia, is in the middle of the Trinity, surrounded by the Trinity. It's just beautiful. So what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what it isn't, and it's not just an hour on Sunday. I mean, you can go to church and speak to no one and walk away, and you can't call that church. You watch something, you might have sang, but if you sat in your seat, talked to no one, and left, you sat in some rows, but you didn't really have church. Right. Church is this place where not only is God uplifted, but we fulfill the one command that Jesus give to, gave to us, which is to love each other as I have loved you. Are you in some kind of setting where you can be known and, and where you can fully know somebody else? Are you in some kind of setting where you can serve somebody and love somebody like Christ loved you? And I think in doing that, Christ is present, I think he's honored, and I do think that the word is lived out, even if it's not in a traditional Bible study. So we talk about numbers. Yeah, you can be in a room of 3,000 and know nobody. Uh, you can also be in a room of four and hide. So I think that the first step, and I think this is in one of the first few chapters of the book, is you have to admit you need somebody. And you may not want them, <laughs> you may not want a bunch of them, but you know you need somebody. And then it comes into, all right, well, how do I go about that? Well, all of our, I mean, you mentioned 38,000 denominations. Did you know there's 2,500 personality tests that are out there? I mean, the amount of self-discovery we can do is, right. is almost nauseating. And you do all of that, and what do you come up with? You come up with this piece of paper that tells you who you are, well, if that's all you have, you look at that and think, nobody can relate to this. And so you think, I've got nobody. But what if you use that as a model for what you could bring to somebody else? I'm an introvert, so I need extroverts around me because they pull things out of me. They make me have courage. An extrovert talked me into asking out a girl that became my wife. You know, it's, it's those kind of people that make us better. All right, so how can I bring uh, I'm an INTJ. How can I bring the J of my personality into somebody's personality that's a P and help them find their car keys and get to their meetings on time, right? right? So it's understanding all that we bring to the table to serve, not just what we need from somebody else and how they can can help us and, and meet our needs. Everything starts... Mm -hmm. When we look at addiction, when we look at, at, at any area in our life, uh, mm. when we look at salvation, it begins with a confession. Mm -hmm. It's a self-realization, right. and we know that about ourselves, but now we're willing to acknowledge that about ourselves. Right? And, and that takes a, that's, that's a, that's a breakthrough. That's a major breakthrough that I know I'm like this, but now I'm willing to say I'm like mm. this. This is what we do with the Lord. Okay, exactly. Lord, I'm sorry I have sinned against you. Right. Uh, I've lived a life I've sinned. I have thought a life of sin. And I ask you to forgive me. We have to do this with our families. We have to do this. Uh, listen, I grew up in an Eastern European home. The concept of a parent apologizing to a child was as if you were speaking to me in a dialect of Mandarin Chinese that only four people in the world spoke to. Okay, so somebody said to me, you know, you need to apologize to your daughter. And I was like, what are you talking about? Right. And I said, really, seriously, I mean, this is new modern day parenting. This is different. 
Right. Uh, it's a whole different time that we're living in. We need to step up and acknowledge that we're human and, and that we're not perfect and we need to get them to not put us on a pedestal because we're only going to fall and that's going to bring more dysfunction. And so it took everything in me to go to my child and apologize to my child. I was so out mm -hmm. of my comfort zone mm -hmm. and it was like, no big deal, daddy, that's okay. It, mm -hmm. was, it was, but but me, I'm I'm sweating bullets and I'm, I'm you know, palpitating and I'm wondering, right. you know, do I need uh, nitro, a little tab of nitroglycerin to, uh, right. to keep myself from stroking out here? This is such, such a huge thing. So you know, I completely understand what, what you're what you're saying. Uh, right. That we've we've got to take a new view of understanding who we are and realizing that God created that not for our purpose, mm. but for his purpose. Mm -hmm. And mm. that in order to make it effective, it has to be applied. Mm -hmm. I, That's I know, right. You know, I, I know that in everybody's home, everybody has that drawer. Right. All right. The one drawer where everything that doesn't have a specific place winds up in that drawer. There are some things in that drawer that you probably should be using. Uh, right. An ointment, uh, an antibiotic or something uh, that you would derive benefit from, but it just sits in the drawer. That's kind of what we do. Right. That's a great analogy because, what we, I mean, how many times have you had that moment where you need to pound a nail in and you don't use a hammer? Exactly. You, you use your shoe, you know, you use uh, the back of a coffee mug or whatever, and it doesn't do the job well, you break something, and you end up having to go get the hammer anyway, when you could have just done that in the first place. I think community is that. I think we've tried, we've tried to, to, to answer that with things that are less vulnerable, less painful for some of us, um, and it's not worked. Social media is an excellent example of that. It's a great place to share and celebrate things, but it's not a great place to have lasting deep friendships with because there's only so far you can go. Now, the millennials with millennial generation would tell us differently, but I think what's going to happen in the next few years is there's going to be a swing away from social media into more face to face conduct and contact. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you saw this in Time magazine a couple weeks ago, but the, the United Kingdom has discovered that uh, the majority of their people are, are confessing that they're lonely and they've appointed a minister of loneliness uh, to their government, which I thought was fascinating. And, and you, you run that against the parallel that the church is dying so rapidly in Europe and loneliness is going up and up and up. So you see that there's this disconnect of we can't quite figure this out, much like what we're dealing with here in America right now with 18 school shootings in the, you know, the first six or seven weeks of our of our new year. Can we not see the connection with less of God and more of the self-destructive lifestyle? I mean, we're basically trying to meet a need with a tool not equipped to, to fix it. Uh, and and biblical community is the thing that God has given us. You know, I don't know anybody that didn't love Little House on the Prairie or some of the older programs. Even uh, uh, we, we, we just had the team from Hallmark Channel from uh, Brian Bird, who has this ongoing of over five million audience. They have like even their own groupies that are this uh, turn of the century coal mine town in West Virginia and it's their fifth season is starting and we had them on to talk about that and they had five million people connecting with this story of of home and community gathering around when the when the 12 coal miners die and they all identify with this community and are you talking about wind calls the heart yes oh my daughter and my my wife love that show they have and it a feels just like Little House on the Prairie. Right. They have a devotional. Oh, no. I, yes. I just had them on to to uh, launch their devotional. So they now oh, have a devotional goodness. out based on that program. So what is it that people identify with that show? Mm -hmm. It is the community. 
-hmm. It is the community interaction. And we don't see ourselves. Now, my family came from shtetls, uh, pogroms, from, from ghettos of Jewish people that were forced to live together. That's why we're, 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 we're kind of a different people. Uh, mm -hmm. Our foods are different. Our language is different. Our mm -hmm. behaviors are different. There's, there's celebrations are different. We have different expressions uh, as a people. But God mm -hmm. created us this way, and the Jewish community is always referred to as the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. All right? You live in a town. Do you have a Jewish community? Mm -hmm. All right. And they probably have a Jewish community center. Mm -hmm. Right. They do. This is the model of Judaism mm -hmm. is that we remain a community because there's only 14 million of us. So how do we remain strong? How do we maintain an identity? Uh, mm. I can't become a Gentile. I can mm. become a Jewish believer, but mm -hmm. I can't become a Gentile. God created mm. Jews and Gentiles. Otherwise, Ephesians 2 doesn't make any sense. Right. From the two, right. he shall make one. Uh, right. So I understand, and I grew up in a Jewish community, in a, in a suburb in, in Pittsburgh, which was a Jewish community. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've lost a lot of the identity of mm. community because it was our... Uh, uh, we we had, and and I'm a post Holocaust generation. Mm -hmm. You would call that baby boomers. I would call that call that the first post Holocaust generation. We mm. were we were the ones to replenish the Jewish community. So I was born 1952, January in 52, uh, mm. ju just in in right right in the sweet spot of that of that era. Uh, and we did have community, and the community gathered together, and the community did things together, and you had social activities together, and you had family activities together, and, and neighborhoods were real neighborhoods, and there right. were real neighborhood communities. And so, uh, and it made us strong. We've survived. Mm -hmm. A third of our population was annihilated. Right. And we survived because of community. Correct. Because we were able to maintain our identity. Right. And I think that what you talk about there is so helpful for all of us, Gentiles especially, because what you have done in your community to maintain the community are traditions. Um, you look clear back in the Old Testament with the feasts and the celebrations and uh, all the things that part of the Jewish calendar um, and the community centers and those kind of things. Those are, are things we can look at that model for us how to establish community. Mm -hmm. So if I want to build friendships, if I want to build community, I need to have some traditions. I need to have some rituals, some repetitious activities that say, this is what we do, this is who we are. I share in the book about a story of when I realized that I was without community, I was community bankrupt, so to speak, and my wife recognized that even though we're both introverts, we definitely needed people. And we found this couple that we just connected with, and she invited them over for dinner on a Friday night. I said, okay, that's fine, they came over. We have, you know, in my mind, that's about a two hour investment. And they leave, you know, a little after two hours, and that was fine. And she said, uh, let's invite them over next Friday. I was, well, now hang on here, all right? That's, that's a lot of time. And she goes, if we're going to build friendships, we have to invest in it. And so we did. And then the next Friday, they invited us over. And the next Friday, they came over to our house. And it's been going on now for six years. That's community. And it's all built on these traditions that then, you know, blossom into other things but it's putting people around you in a strategic type of fashion that help you truly together better. I'm going to challenge you at RLS, RLC, I'm sorry, at Real Life Church to put Jesus in vests. <laughs> All right. Buddy, I'm not forgetting that. That right. was brilliant. <laughs> right. Je Jesus invests in community. Absolutely. 
I, I think there's a real message there because Jesus did invest in communities. He went into the community and he changed the landscape of the community. Absolutely. And like believers came together. And when we read, and, and this is the part that I think people have so missed. It is the last line of Acts chapter 2. Hmm. And it says, and God added to their numbers daily mm. those being saved. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister. Okay? That just happens to be when I got ordained as a Messianic rabbi, I also got ordained as a Southern Baptist uh, minister. Uh, and uh, each year they issue a report on baptisms, the number of baptisms, and for 10 consecutive years, it's been a declining number. Mm. And it's, it's very disturbing to me because I'm a Jewish believer, and I'm like Paul, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation, for all who believe to the Jew first. And so you're right now, you're at, it's 8.49 p.m. in Jerusalem, uh, and uh, it's Shabbat, but I can promise you uh, that the religious are not watching this on the internet, but the rest of the secular Judy Jewish community of Tel Aviv and other communities are watching this program on the internet, and I know exactly what I'm talking about. That that they f they found community. You mm -hmm. find like, it, and it's not like-minded. Everybody mm -hmm. doesn't have to be in agreement, right? Because exactly. if you know, it's that song. Jesus is just all right with me. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, right. And we've made it about so many other things that we forget that you and I are not responsible for salvation. Mm. It's God added to their numbers daily. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they had fellowship together. They broke bread together. They prayed together. No one was in need because they took what they had and they shared it with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. The end result of us not doing community is the fact that there has to be a united way. There has to be a red cross. There has to be this charity and this charity and this charity and this charity because in the 50s, it was the par local parish church. Exactly. There exactly. wasn't a community way. There right. wasn't the, the uh, places on the monopoly board uh, the community <laughs> chest. Okay? Right. There right. was the local congregation, and if a family fell in hard times, the local congregation stepped in. Right. We look at the communities that we mock, mm -hmm. the Amish. Mm -hmm. They build each other's homes, they raise each other's barns, they uh, fire tears it down, and two weeks later, a new house is up. And mm -hmm. there hasn't been a GoFundMe account, and there nope. hasn't been a social media push. Uh, <laughs> it's been the local community responded to the need. And we, so, we look at it and say, oh, that's so old-fashioned, and they're so out of it. And you know what? They're so right. Mm -hmm. Maybe their theology doesn't line up with my theology. Maybe their view of, 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 of uh, technology, they would get along great, with the ultra-Orthodox rabbis, uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're on the same level. Okay? Don't start a fire, don't light a light, don't, a lot of things. But that community has maintained their identity. Mm -hmm. And you can't shake them mm -hmm. from that. You're right. And You're right. There's models of that in the Bible mm -hmm. of when we didn't act like a community, guess what God did? He broke mm -hmm. us up. He sent us to Babylon. Right. When we stopped doing what he asked us to do, he said, go away. You, right. st you still own the land. You just can't enjoy it anymore. That's right. And I'm going right. to send you, and I'm going to show you what it's, it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. If you keep this stuff up, I'm going to show you what it's going to be like. Okay? It, you had tough enough for 400 years under Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, I told you, I told you in the desert, okay, the right to the land is yours, but the enjoyment of the land is predicated on your 
obedience in doing what I want you to do. Don't take on other gods. Don't intermarry. Don't do these things. Maintain your community identity because assimilation okay, is going to destroy you as a people. Right. Is that not the same message today that I am supposed to be in the world but not of the world? Assimilation will exactly. destroy the community? Absolutely. Absolutely. The more divided we get, the less we make church a priority, the less we be the church and just instead of just going to church, uh, the less we do those kind of things, the more we tear apart the moral fabric, not only of our, of our nation, but our church and our families. Um, that's going to be our breakdown because we're losing that value of us being together, which is where needs are met. In Acts 2, it says, and all their needs were met because of, of what they've done there. I mean, in the, you know, it was the, the Christians that rescued children off of the, you know, the um, uh, doorsteps of people who didn't want that child. Right. They rescued the mentally ill. They rescued those who were born with birth defects uh, and left for dead. Uh, they rescued those with leprosy, with no regard for their own health. And there was no need for welfare. There was no need for uh, social aid from the government because the church took care of it. And in a much smaller scope, if the church would take care of each other in just the social needs that we have and emotional needs we have, uh, we would feel less of a need to go elsewhere uh, and get ourselves into all kinds of trouble. We're at the point where we've, we've actually run out of time. It's just been say like uh, the most natural conversation that could possibly take place between two friends. The point is church is not about the gospel. Church is not about salvation. Church is about community. And it's a community where you can learn new things you never heard before, like about the savior, like about the gospel, like about the word of God, but <laughs> you can join together with people and find your place in a community, whether or not it's at the top or the middle or the bottom. King David said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than sit on the throne of all mankind. Mm. This is for all of us to go and restore community. It doesn't take a tragedy like what just happened in Florida for a community to come together. Let's come together as a community so those tragedies can't happen again. Rusty George, thank you so much for sharing this with us. The book is called Better Together, Discover the Power of Community. Rusty George, thank you so much for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you. It's been a joy. God bless you, my friend. And that brings to an end our live broadcast day, but that doesn't mean we go off the air. All of these episodes from today's programming will be replayed throughout the day all across the world for the next 24 hours. Then you'll find us on our YouTube channel and our WNDTV feed. Until we see you right back here in the studio on Monday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time, we bid you shalom, shabbat shalom, and wish you a great week. Shavuot Tov, as we say in the Hebrew, and until we see you here Monday morning, we bid you Shalom.